two different dimensions. There's two different ones. Uh, that was a very good, at first it looked really like a good possibility because there is an existing line along there but it's a little taller. Uh, but the problem we've got into there is that our DOT is looking at upgrading that one in the very near future. But if you look at the right of way, it's very, very narrow uh, in terms of what they would have to have. And so consequently, one of the things that NEA has to concern themselves about is if they are located in the highway right of way of the permit and they have to move within a period of time, then they essentially have to bear the cost of doing that. So that would be pretty risky as an option. Uh, and so consequently, we didn't like to look at that one so much. Okay, now we looked at the Parks Highway. I'll come back to the Parks for just a moment. We looked at an alignment along the railroad, and then we also looked at an alignment going south. Our original effort in going south was to come a little higher up in this general area. But as we got started working on it, we found that uh, there was a new master plan that had been approved. Uh, for a large subdivision area all through here, and so consequently we were looking at numerous individual lots, okay, which would really push up the, the cost essentially on that southern route. In addition, we were looking at a lot of wetlands and then some of those kind of concerns. But I hope that's going to hold questions so I got because otherwise we would bog down the questions. Okay, so we looked at that one, and then we looked at the railroad. Um, the railroad being as curvilinear as it is, uh, the, the lots of turns, the problem with that is that you end up putting with lots and lots of guys that's very expensive in construction. Uh, and the area that we really wanted to use the railroad the most was this portion over here as we got closer into to Wasilla. Uh, and the problem there is if you look at where the railroad is, it's right down the middle of the block that's sitting there cut through. And so it's steep below it and steep above it. And their concern with us was if we put a pole in, what would that do to the stability of the soils either below or above their railroad alignment as well? Okay, so that was another issue. The last one of the, the group was the Parks Highway. Uh, and when we had the DOT, DOT actually was very responsive to primarily, primarily because of the reason Parks is already built to its full width, pretty much, for the next many, many years. In other words, it's already a fully developed corridor, and they have sufficient right-of-way and sufficient area that it doesn't create impact so that we wouldn't be conflicting with future DOT activities. The other reason that we are interested in following a line such as that is that what happens is it reduces the impact on the adjacent owners. Uh, what we've considered very significantly is that most of the ownership along the Clarks Highway is commercial property. What does that mean? That means most all of those folks have cleared all their trees, uh, so consequently we don't have the issue of danger trees or concerns, uh, and so we need to maintain our clear zones for our electric lines, but we don't have to do a large, wide swath of clearing to protect those lines because it's already cleared. Uh, they're looking for their own visibility for you to see them from the road. So consequently, it means we end up needing a lot less right-of-way from private individuals. And the reality, with the, by the time you look at the setbacks and the commercial use, essentially there's not much impact on the property owners because they can still use their parking lots and they can still use the other things that are typically in that stretch. Uh, so those were some significant things that we looked at here, and ultimately we came to the conclusion that this was probably our best alignment. Again, uh, we didn't have any issues with the DOT. We got into it, and we recently met with the city. One of the concerns was the area around the Cottonwood, not uh, Cottonwood Creek, but uh, around the uh, Palmer Wasilla intersection. Uh, so they asked us to try to find a way to avoid that because they feel that some, somewhere in the future that intersection is going to take a lot of work uh, and it's very problematic. So consequently, we looked at an alignment that take us down around behind the Cottonwood Creek Mall and back in <coughs> the Cottonwood Creek and then up over and onto the Palmer Wasilla and then to uh, the Herning substation, which is over here. Uh, it's kind of due south of the railroad station there in Wasilla. Okay, so those were the alignments. Ultimately, we came out and said we preferred this particular alignment. Uh, at that point, then we went to the city. Uh, we have to get a permit from the city to be able to construct the line within the city. Uh, there we ran into a snag. Okay. Um, the city was not uh, very uh, appreciative of our efforts, and so we were looking at some issues with the permitting process. Uh, we felt that we probably needed to go back out and do a little bit more community outreach, uh, get more awareness of all the different options and the impacts of the different alignments. Uh, so consequently, after doing that, we then moved over to another alignment opportunity here. And this is the one that concerns most of the folks in this room, is that we looked at them Besides these routes, we also we went back and looked at Bogart, and the reason we looked back at Bogart is we could permit that. 
Right? We have an existing alignment, so we don't have to get new permits in terms of um, municipal permits or some of those things. So from a permitting standpoint, it's probably one of the easier routes to do, but it's much longer, much more expensive, and we have to tear down an existing line that really has a lot of economic life, <coughs> and it doesn't give us the redundancy that we were looking for in other alternatives. Just one. Yeah. I'm sorry, but a lot of people don't know that there was a Cotton Creek uh, with Mall. Uh, okay, Creekside Plaza and Alice Yeah, Alice. it's okay. Target and everything okay. else. So I have to watch out about Cotton 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 Cotton. Cotton. <laughs> <laughs> So you said Cottonwood Creek Mall, and I'm thinking that was like... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay, well I've aged myself. <laughs> but anyway, so what we did, we came back and said, okay, let's look at some other options. Uh, one of the concerns the city had was that we were going to inspect their view shed. So they said, can you go to the back lot lines? Uh, well, one of the problems of going with the back lot lines is that instead of being able to use the highway right-of-way, which cuts our right-of-way needs in half, uh, consequently we have to get a 100-foot wide right-of-way because now we're in places where indeed there, there wasn't a place to take advantage of a, a highway corridor. Uh, so consequently it put us in the back of this area, and, and as you'll see from some of the figures on your handouts there, uh, there's some pretty significant costs associated with putting a 100 foot wide right of way back in, in behind this location. In addition, it also then impacts the view of the individual homeowners right there that live in that subdivision right along the bluff. Okay, so there were some concerns there. Uh, but primarily from our side of it is it, it, it's roughly about the same length as the Parks Highway, but considerably more expensive and considerably more risky from our perspective. Um, we also then looked at the Cottle, the Hernan. Going, instead of going to Herney, coming down to Common Substation. Right? What this does, it's a little longer route, but it also provides some redundancy. It connects essentially Lazelle, which is what we call one of our radial feed stations, over here to Common Substation. So it interconnects those two, and this then provides essentially another route to provide additional service for these areas. Okay, one of the things that you will see. Before you call them the Cobble. Yeah, is that the one right down here? Cobble is just down you know, about three miles back the road on the left hand side. You know where the equipment place is? And the big uh, power is yeah. right in there. That's okay, what's the one that's out here by Seven? Yeah, ABC Rentals. What's the one here by Seven? Yeah, this one is, well, you got Teeland and you got uh, 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 the name of, what's the other one? Theodore. What's that? Theodore. Theodore, okay. So you have several other. The one we're talking about is, is going into the cotton. All right. um, what we did is when we looked at this alignment, and again, these are all preliminary. We're trying to find a best fit. None of them comes without problems. Uh, none of them comes without concerns or impacts, and that's part of what the whole what about process gas is about. What's that? You have a main mm -hmm. gas line. Yeah, we have a gas line. I mean, we're the close main to gas line. Yeah. yeah, well, again. And I won't wait until uh, he gets his. So essentially, we looked at this as an alternative. Again, it's longer, it's a little more expensive, but it does, in the long range, it ties in the system and it works as a system situation. It is not our preferred alternative, okay? But our situation is we have to be able to permit one of them to be able to get there. Uh, and so that's part of what's going on here is we're looking at alternatives, looking at other ways. And as I say, our preferred alternative is the Parks Highway. Uh, what I've got is a couple extra, well, just real briefly, you know. This is on, you've got this information on your handout, so I won't spend a whole lot of time, but it gives you an idea of the cost. Essentially, we're looking at about uh, 10,000, 10 million for the original Parks Highway route. We're looking at uh, going the back lot line would be about 13 and a half, so you're adding about three and a half million to go just to avoid the, the view shed of the, of the highway, let's put it that way. Um, and then if the city said, well, we want you to put it underground. Well, the three miles of undergrounding of this transmission line, what happens? You have to build every 2,000 feet. You essentially have to put a vault in, all right? And that's just part of it. You just can't pull the wires through the conduits and so forth. Well, you know what happens with buried vaults in Alaska in the wintertime? <laughs> you know, the water. What happens with the water in the wintertime? It freezes. So the reality of it is it really, for a transmission line, it's really a bad situation. You can do it with distribution because you can get away with it a little easier, but for transmission lines, all of a sudden you've got a high voltage area there. You don't really want out of commission because it takes a lot of days to repair. You have to go in and, and work one of those, so that keeps you out for quite a while. Um, and then we looked at the cobble again. We're looking at almost 14 million, so another four billion to come that different direction. The advantage again, though, is it does tie in parts of the system. Uh, and the Bogart was almost 15 million, and probably a little worse than that. Is there anything else I want to cover? And I'll drop over for questions.
Yeah, well, I do, as a matter of fact. And here's, this one is a little bit more for you folks in the Connell route. Uh, we've got some of the streets and some of the roads, so if it's in your neighborhood, uh, then you have an opportunity to come up and take a look at it or see where it's at. Uh, unfortunately, one of the, the handouts in front we got the Bogart Road instead of the, the Cottle Road on the back. One set has the, the, the other line up here. Okay. Then, some of the ones we, what we've done is we put up a rendering, and this is roughly what it would be looking like if we were going down through the stretch downtown. <laughs> it's beautiful. Diamonds. Pretty as The reality is there's going to be an impact wherever it goes. And we can't avoid that. Great spot for right? But again, what we're looking at here is our perception was one of the reasons we chose this alignment. This is a commercial corridor. It's already strictly utilized for commercial activities. Uh, I would have to say that this one doesn't quite leave the same number of luminaries that you get coming from the other direction. Uh, but there's a lot of other activities and things that are going here. I know one of our concerns about coming to the with some of these others is now we're affecting homes, residents, uh, individuals, and it's much more concerned. Uh, because you're the folks that really take the brunt of it. I don't think we have an impact very much on the commercial property in terms of value loss, but the impact of the private property is a little more significant. It may not make a difference in value, but it certainly makes a difference in perspective and how people feel about all of that. Uh, these things can run anywhere from 80 to 100. Okay. Uh, so, so how okay. do you help the parks want to move through instead of the fair well, I mean, again, that's part of the public testimony. Here, right. Okay, I mean, that's, that's, we've had open houses. We had one last fall. Uh, we had a few folks show up, and then we had, we've had two recent open houses in a public hearing. Uh, we had quite a bit of testimony, and we had quite a bit of attendance at the public house, so, open houses. So you're saying you prefer the group that's in Russell? Our, our preferred, preferred route is the Parks Highway along through Russell. Instead yes. of through all the subdivisions. Yeah, that's up right. and down I mean, that's, but again, at the end of the day, we, we can't control the permitting process, so we have to be out there saying here's what some of the options are and what we're looking at. Question so here. this gentleman was asked the first question. Is there already an established utility corridor going through the heart of West Silver? Because I remember pulling wire 30 years ago out there, and they had us here marked where we had to stay. And now, like with the underbill, we can carry that stuff. We got everything in the world up here now that needs to do it with us. We could buy less structures, we can put Meyer towers up there, which we've got cars parking lot right now. Everybody knows what they are. You don't have to worry about down guys, fan guys, nothing. You got the footers there that hold it. And, and that's something anybody looked at that stuff? And I'll let that you know. I think at this point right now our, our instructions are to take a look at what we've got here. What we what we're doing is we're looking at a three-phase underbuilt. All right, and that would be the same if they came out cobble or otherwise, and the impact of that is essentially it provides you know, a lot more distribution capability. So that there are areas that they would serve that don't now have ready access to power. So that the one problem with the transmission line is that if we were just building the upper portion, you know, adjacent owners don't have any, it's no benefit to them. They can't get power from it. They can't step it down well enough to be able to serve an adjacent owner. And that's the purpose of having an underbuild so that you also have power available to the adjacent owners. Okay, the lady back here was yeah, next. I'm sorry. <coughs> that's okay. I think this is really ugly. And why aren't we putting this underground? He did tell her, but that's an unacceptable answer. Now, we've got right. some of the best engineers in the world that's coming out of our universities. You can't figure out how to make a trip that doesn't collect water. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 I'm not going to tell you any different. We're hearing okay, so it's seven, it's seven heard to it 12 cost. times the cost of building okay. overhead. All right. I, well, heard that's cost, I heard it cost this year. Who's paying? The rate payer. Or DOT? Rate payer. No, no, we are. We are. We are. And why isn't DOT paying? Why wouldn't they? They don't have a Because they have a project that intersects this for a mile. Why does a DOT pay for the right of way and reduce? Ratepayers' electric bills along Fairview. Okay, what, what Ken's referring to, there's a stretch. <coughs> Essentially, we're. No, it doesn't They have the money already for the bonding. And the stretch that Ken's talking about is between Tony Act and effectively Candy Wine. And how much money do they have? 
What's that? Oh, yeah. I think they have forty-seven million dollars in bonding. Okay, but, but, but the reality of it is, again, this is an electric transmission line, and it is basically it's the co-op's obligation to provide power to its members. Okay, and it's their reliability. So at the end of the day. Um, it, it does come out of the co-op members, you know, cost, okay? It's going to be part of the rate structure. And that's part of what we're looking at. It's part of the reason that we recommended the, the one alignment we did is that that saves $3 million, which saves, again, it's less money that comes out ultimately out of the rate payer. Uh, when you start talking about $40 million, and I, I, I'm not going to tell you that it might not be 29 or 28 it could be 50 for all I know. But, again, those are the estimates that we got from a, a reliable engineering firm. Yes, sir. Did it. I can't speak for anybody else here, but I would rather my rates go up than to have that in my backyard. I mean, we live here for a purpose, for a reason. We have a beautiful view, and I don't want that thing sticking out. I don't either. I have this Yeah. I don't I'm only in Vancouver. I don't know how much more it's going to cost me in the monthly. You know. I'd rather it underground. Well, I mean, and you're welcome to please provide those comments. Okay. I mean, that's something that. Um, We'll take the comments, but again, what we do at the end of the day, we have an obligation to the ratepayers to be proven and, what if you want and to, to make sure that we don't it. impact property. What do you have to pick it up and move it across the street? You have to get, you have to raise those lines way up just to move a house across. There's a lot of house movers out there. <laughs> we have a lady here that's been very patient. Go ahead. I think my right arms get stronger than you put out your exercises. I thought it was in my invisible mode. My question is that picture you showed us of those lines above ground, those are high powered lines, correct? That's correct. And they're running parallel to each other. So is that not producing what's called eddy currents? And my question is, maybe it's houses or businesses, have you all done a survey on the cancer increase of the people in those dwellings. And if you take those lines and you consolidate them in the ground, won't they still be producing those currents? Okay, what, what you're talking about are electromagnetic fields? EM, yes, okay, sir. Right. And, and you're also looking at the issue of the huge current because of the lines going longitudinally. It is a transfer, it's just the lines being together. Yeah. And most of the studies, and, and I have a whole volume of the World Health Organization, and I, I don't have my website linked on it, but Essentially, there's a website out there that has collected studies after studies after studies. When we're talking about transmission lines and the voltage of this, it doesn't. This is much much lower than the ones that historically were the ones that raised the issues. Okay, and so the other side of that is that, that if you look at the studies and the statistics, some states have actually regulated the distance away from the transmission lines. Most of them don't even get to this level. I mean, it's it's much higher levels of voltage that need that kind of regulation. How could that be? I mean, I'm a lot. You know, it's like how are you going to change current? I mean, up, down, it's still electricity. Uh, what I can do is that I'll give Berkeley a, a copy of the, the, the website that you can go to to take a look at. Uh, I believe, does any of have, you have a handout or a brochure on it? Uh, no, we don't have one, but I think the website's a better okay, option so for everybody. The World Health Organization um, is their website. Um, and Take a look. For any of you guys that got just just a second, for any of those guys that you did get uh, my email is on there. You should just send me a email copy and I'll forward everything that he's got. We have a guy in the back being very patient with the question. Why don't you just come across the hill? Come across the arm here. It's like half the distance. Just do it like they brought it over from Beluga to Anchorage. Yeah. You got the new distribution out here. If Wasilla wants some power, they can pay for it to come get it. <laughs> you got Vine Road right here, you know. You can bring it straight across, dude. And, and we What's up with that? Well, can you take a preliminary look at that and it's, you know, the problem when you get into summer and cable gets very, very expensive. Uh, they did it to take it to Anchorage yeah. and, and 50 yeah. years ago. Yeah. And uh, if you ask, still going. True gas is the most expensive line that they have. So, anyway, <laughs> we've got one right back, Mr. Tanner. No. I have one comment to make. I'm on Social Security. If my electric bill goes up anymore in the winter, I'm going to have to give up eating. That's all. Yeah. Ma'am, go ahead. Um, you said that there's a public hearing on the 14th. Yes, ma'am. Where and what time? It's at the City Council and the City of Los Angeles Chamber. Okay. okay. The yeah. Planning Commission. 7, yeah. 7 p.m.? Uh, yeah. I've got a question. I, 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 I don't recall right. I think it is, but. 
I didn't check. Yeah, it, it'll be on the City of Wasilla's yeah. website. It's on their website. Okay, thank you. Okay, Dan. Uh, the first open house meeting we had on this, we had seven million dollar difference. The second one we had five million, and now you say four million. What's happening in this time? It's pretty great. The difference between the cost for the uh, follow every follow line. You're not asking the numbers. Sure, change for this. Those three meetings. I don't believe so either because I've been in charge of those, these handouts that you've got. Take a look at your other handouts and if, if you find that they're different, let me know. Uh, all right, then you can find them. Another thing we have to add is a very important to that fairview route. And this was a hangout for the first thing about the fairview we had this year. One of the condo locations was down in. Because that's a choke point there, and uh, twice a choke point. You got uh, a couple of things. You got an air injection that goes over perpendicular right now. over the crowd. Uh, you got the high pressure gas line, and then you also have this 20 unit condo association. If you take the part of the car, you take the well, the well house, and at least one building. If you take those, unfortunately, you take the whole condo thing because there is not a uh, legal place to put another well because of the septic. So what are you going to do? Spend a couple of million to bring it And then that's part of it. Again, what we're looking at here right now is this is a route selection. In other words, we're not down to the, the finite detail. And obviously, if there are issues, every one of these routes is going to have some types of issues. Well, I, I, would suggest, I would suggest that would happen probably by that whole condo thing out because of the impractability of putting water to it again and so forth. And that's over two and a half million just in property alone. Okay, I'd like to hear from people that haven't already talked. If you got any questions, you mentioned that you have to put a bulk in every two miles. That's not two thousand. The underground underground is every two thousand feet to be able to pull the wire through the condo. Okay, so that's only in the underground portion. But that's part of what makes the underground portion so expensive is, is the concrete vaults. I mean, there you, you look at Anchorage and, and you look, you'll see a concrete vault, you'll see transformers sitting over those concrete vaults. Um, my other question I had was, uh, I, I just look at things from a very simplistic but financial point of view. If you're running all of these wires underground, what's the difference in cost to the electrical union? terms of their hours, their wages, what do they make running this line versus running the underground line? I think the cost is in the construction line. And then the other problem is then ultimately the cost is if you have an outage, there's what we call mean time to repair, and in the wintertime up here it would be pretty significant. What you're talking about, when we talk about the existing underground, all the underground in Anchorage and all the underground in Alaska, with one exception, uh, other than the submarine cables going across the Kinnikar, um, those are lower voltage. Most of those are 34.5 or lower, which is essentially a distribution level of power as opposed to a transmission level. Right? And, and so consequently what you're talking about is local feeds. If you have an outage of those, you'll affect a few homeowners. If you have an outage of one of these things, you can affect a lot of homes. And that's really the big difference between the two. Okay, we have a lady here with a question. Um, is that big tower there taller than the ones in the car's parking lot? And if so, by uh, how much? I would say it's pretty close. To it. it might be just a little bit taller, uh, simply because we've got the unbuilt one here with this one. Okay. Our cars range from 75 to 80 feet. Yeah. So uh, there's there, there, there a question in the back here. I, I just was going to say I looked on the website, it's my phone, and it's at 7 o'clock on May 14th. Okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead. <coughs> Decision where it's going to be, we have a chance to provide input. It's kind of 
Okay, and, and right now again, it's, it's route selection, so it's until we get in, and just like jumping over here brought up, there's issues with wells, there are issues with you know, residences and so forth. So we're going to have to make a decision. Okay, and so we'll have to go back and take another look at that. If we have existing facilities, okay, along Fairview, for instance, the one stretch that we will be looking at being on the road, the rest of it is all on the, the section lines and the property lines that are outside of the road system. Uh, that one stretch, there is an existing line, and we would probably over replace that existing line with the new one. Okay, so that's where we would like to go with that location. That's not the question. Okay. When, 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 when does the decision get made, and is there a chance? What, what is the exact placement of the line? It seems to me we're headed down the track where we're on the other side of the line. We're going to make a decision before that. We have a chance to come. And, and I, 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 we wouldn't know that answer until we get out and actually physically start working on the design itself. In other words, actually physically say, okay, where can we put structures? Where can we put the alignment? Where's going to have the least impact? Okay. Part of what we look at is, is again, every time we put in an angle structure, in other words, if we cross a road and we turn or we just operate that, that adds a significant cost. So what we attempt to do is to make sure we can get as long and straight of alignment as we possibly can. Right. So what we do then is, as we look at that, we say, what impacts does this side have compared to maybe that side? So we'll be looking and weighing those. And, and what the opportunity would be is, put your comments down. I mean, those that don't, they will all be considered. Any comments that you have will be considered in terms of where we go ultimately. But we have to make a decision at some point. But we're going to rely then on engineering to say, is it feasible? Is it rational? Okay. If we need to go, if we were to go this line from here. Right? There are a number of places that we're going to have to look at that we have conflicts. Right? Every alignment has conflicts that we may look and say, do we move the line a little bit in this location to put it somewhere else? But that comes as you get into specific looking at the route. So all I can tell you is if we're looking at generic, you know, what we did with all of these alignments is we looked and said, how many homes, how many people do we affect? Um, and if you start looking at some of these alignments, uh, it's virtually impossible to get a straight line anywhere without going right through the middle of some subdivisions, right? And so what we were looking for was one, to utilize existing lights of way, and two, was to minimize the impact on the adjacent owners. And so those will be things that we will continue looking. Are we going to avoid all impacts? No, there's no way we can avoid all impacts. So we'll, and the design process will make our best efforts to do so, and we will take the input that we get from, from the members of the public. But at some point, we have to make a Second one, really quick. Can, does the Wasilla Council have the ability to deny the permit because they want to, or are there objective criteria that you have to rely on? <coughs> Well, I'm going to have to tell you that I don't know what their legal counsel would advise them. Um, I don't feel that there's really strong standards in their, their code to tell you what that answer would be. Sorry. Price, the line to the 
the uh, airport and a uh, locator pad and a clock cable. The repair had begun by some people coming from overseas over here. Shoe gash is one of assisted, but they had to stay outside the manhole while the guys that sat there and did the repairs in some foreign country sat there and did the repairs. So there's some pros and cons. And the ground is beautiful, but it's expensive. Especially the, you know, basically going under the water. That's real expensive. So um, you have to be thinking about that. But you also have to think about long term. Huh? You also have to think about long term. How, how is this going to affect any? Sure, you may have to spend a little bit of money in the beginning, but is it going to be cost effective in the long term? That's what you need to be thinking about as well. Yes, you need to do that, and one of the things that you'll find is if you talk to most linemen and most companies that sit there and the overhead line they like because they can drive down the road, they see where the repair is, they fix it. Underground, you got to go trace it out. And if you know where those are exactly, that helps isolate a little bit. It takes a whole lot longer to locate a fault and fix it. But I'm not talking about underground. I'm talking about from the <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. And he was saying that, like Chugach did that, you know, for you know, for angry. And sure, I, I understand what you're saying. It's totally a, a very expensive. But and sure, maybe it'll be expensive in the short term. But I'm saying in the long term, maybe it would be better in the long term. It would keep rates down for people in the future. Let me just throw one thing in here before we get another question. When he was talking about route selection, that's what we're looking at today. The comments and thoughts you have now, it might be good to get them on board. If you don't like a particular route and you see conflicts in there pointed out now, to point to a different route. And this is this is part of what you should be doing on uh, your comments is to be able to get them to MEA, get them to Mr. Beardsley, so that they look and they go, oh, the Colorado route, my God, there's so many conflicts there that before the route's selected, they take it. Susan, I'll let you go there, but we got another couple in the back, and I know you've talked several times, so go ahead, quickly. Well, I'm just got, I'm thinking about the DOT, I'm thinking about uh, the park, and I'm thinking about MEA, I'm thinking about power, the whole object, the whole thing. And it seems to me that if you were to bring power to Anchorage, build a station there at Point McKenzie, and from Point McKenzie, you know, through the Port Authority, and create a line, a straight line, it would be a hell of a lot cheaper in the long run to run it underground all the way. There's nothing there. There's no no buildings, no subdivisions. It's just dirt. For $250 and just go million for dollars too, too late. We already got a plan to include them. Yeah, but, but you know, Alaska is the new frontier. And we, this is fresh. The territory is fresh. That's all I'm saying. And if we start new and we start young and we do it the right way, not like everybody else, and have to do it the first time and then say, okay, we made a mistake, let's do it again. We made a mistake, let's do it again. Like New York, like LA, like everybody else. That's all I'm saying. Not disagreeing. Let's spend the money, spend the money, do it right the first time, have DOT put their their money into it, let the state put their money into it, MEA can put their little bit of money into it, and then through us, we're the ones that, that pay everybody anyway. The state's put their money in a dam, and I have a question there to ask, yes ma'am. Yeah, it's a little hard to see on the papers exactly which properties are affected by routes. Is there a website that clearly shows, or is there a does it list which properties or addresses would be affected by each route? Well, what happened? We sent, you know, we sent out a letter to everybody that yeah. on the on the route <coughs> the borough mailing list. Uh, you got probably what twenty percent of the back. Because people don't want to let the borough know where they are. Yes, I borough. I mean, I say we sent letters, <laughs> but the reality of it is the alignment. For instance, the one on Fairview is we're talking about going down the section line pretty much virtually all the way through there with some deviation because you've got some areas you have no section line, some of these are old homesteads, okay. some areas you do have section line easements. Uh, again, we want to utilize what we will look at in the ultimate decision is we would look at how can we 
pick a route that has the least impact on the adjacent owners that we can utilize the most existing right of way uh, to do that. And so right now, my anticipation again would be, if, if I were to pick one right now, I'd say it'd be on the south side, okay, of that section line. But there are issues and some conflicts. Again, there's a gas line issue there, there's some different things. So again, until we get in and do a finite design, if we even get to that direction, I mean, our preferred alignment isn't. Okay. So there's no but way to tell whether your property is going to be in the right of way or whatever. She asked for a website that you yeah. might have to. But we aren't going to have any better mapping than because we don't know which side of the line we're going to go. I mean, okay, because this this map sucks. Yes, maybe. <laughs> hey Dan, couldn't we take as a resolution from this group and say that we favor running it through Wasilla instead of Fairview? Here we are, all assembled, and instead of one comment, we could speak as a community council. Yeah, we certainly could have a resolution proposed. Uh, not, not a problem there. I do want to ask one question for that, and I don't know if you can answer or Gary. Does MEA have the powers of condemnation? They do. Uh, yes, the certificate of convenience and public necessity. You know, in terms of when they're granted the, essentially the right to be able to provide service to their members and their cooperative. When, as a publicly regulated utility, when they get the certificate of convenience and necessity, that does give them the power. And you have to get that certificate for a particular line selected, so or is it a generic? No, that's for their service area. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Could, could you explain that for one? Yeah, okay. The service area, essentially, wherever the power, you power of eminent domain. Okay, that's what you have yeah, to Yeah, so I want to just be clear that they do have the power of eminent domain, because we've heard it both ways. Now, I've heard a suggestion to have a resolution. Do I hear a proposal? Are you really seriously thinking that if you build that big of a power line, that people aren't going to have trees in that power line easement? You're going to come through and you're going to mow down all those trees. And you're going to create, you're going to create that uh, wind, like uh, the Palmer Law Solo Highway, when they took out all those trees, and the wind comes through, and it comes howling through, you're going to do that. Because you know that wind comes yeah, it, through there, and it's, it's going to flow. It's a, and if you have trees, it's under, foot clear, you don't think you're going to knock into the, those power oh. lines? Seriously? We're back to asking for a resolution from the group. We had a proposal. Right I have mm -hmm. two hands up. The, one, the gentleman in the back was up first. I think this gentleman made a motion. That yes, and I'm, I'm waiting to hear a resolution. I, I would like to make a second to that motion. <laughs> well, there's nothing. <laughs> we need to have a resolution. You have to actually yeah. say a, a regular proposal. Yeah. Well, the proposal was that we, we take the Wasilla. Okay. You have to formally right. say it. So I propose the resolution from this body then, just so I can clarify, is that this body, the Connect Fairview Community Council, will issue a resolution to MEA that they not select anything along, I guess it's called the Coddle Route, if that's appropriate, and instead be on the, or one of the two parks highway routes. Is that correct? Am I hearing that? All right, now they have the motion and you have the second. That's correct. All right, now discussion. All those in favor, aye. 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 Oh, opposed? <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> <laughs> we will definitely get that forwarded on. If you have to give me a second here to get notes on it. Do you have any other questions for Mr. Beardsley? Because we do have other people here. Mr. Salmon? I, I want to know when all this is supposed to come online. What's the like subjective? Well, again, the, the very first segment, which would be the one from including the generation station to the hospital substation, needs to come online next year. We will be acquiring and building that as well. We should probably next winter. This one we'd like to follow on right along behind it. But obviously, if, until we can select a route, we can't design it. And until we design it, we can't order materials and, and so on. So it's but this going isn't to, like 10 years now. No, no. We're, we're talking within a, a year or two at the most, I would think. All right, Mr. Salmon. Probably within a year. Well, Mr. Salmon had a question. More of a pragmatic point of view. What if this gentleman alluded to it behind me? Well, someone just says no. How do we get them to say yes? What if they just say no? Under no circumstances will we allow you? And, and I think that and more outages, they'll see it always. 
No, I'd like an answer. Well, let's, let's see her an answer to the extent that you can answer that, because I know that she's, he's educated as an engineer, not an attorney. Yeah. Whether we can condemn the city of Wasilla or not, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How does MDA as a co-op? How does MDA as a co-op? It can be just explained that as a co-op to get a certificate of uh, uh, community service and they are regulated by a, a regulatory board and that right there, there that regulatory board state statute gives them the power of condemnation and that's not just MEA that's Chugiak a private outfit that's MNL and P a city owned outfit that's Homer Electric another co-op um, Healing and Star, we have a question here. There's no precedence that I'm aware of a party this of a, of a cooperative condemning this municipality, okay? That's, that's all I can say. Whether we could or not, that's a, it's a close call, I think. Yes. Can NEA give us a breakdown of members living within the boundaries of Mozilla? as opposed to Palmer, as opposed to Grail, to the greater area. I mean, we have 7,500 people that live in Wasilla and 80,000 that are in the greater areas. Can they break that down? We're not able to give out private information. We can't give you that. I'm sorry. You wouldn't want me to give your information out, so I can't give you no. Gary, he wasn't asking for specifics. He just wanted a gross number? number within the city yeah. and then without. Yeah, we can put a number. A yeah, number. that's all he was asking. Yes, I'll take right. a note. Okay, um, point McKenzie, 20 years, 30 years, definitely 50 years, this is going to be a big thing. I mean, it's got that potential. <coughs> Will these power lines be powering the Point McKenzie area, or are we going to have to focus on alternate plans for that in that future? Well, I, 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 yeah, there's long-range plans going on right now in terms of the rail belt and, and what's going on. But again, those are in the future. What we're talking about here is within the NEA system, right? So this is totally within NEA's control for their individual substation, their network. Will that be part of the NEA system too, uh, Point McKenzie? Um, it, Again, if you go yes. out to Point McKenzie, but there also is that connects, there's some connections ultimately. Well, Teeland connects up to Douglas, which is part of the inner tie. Mm -hmm. Part of that goes over some of the MBA's facilities right now. Um, so, well, I mean, would they potentially need a new power plant out there, or? And, and again, what they're looking at is ultimately, there's the talk of ultimately tying it all in as a grid, okay? And what they would most likely do at that point, and again, don't hold me for this, I'll just, Again, what they're likely to do is they'll probably go to a larger voltage transmission line to serve a lot larger. And again, so they'll have very key substations that they will bring the load to, and then those will then follow into these networks. And so what would happen is there would probably be a network, a large substation that would connect into uh, MEA's network, again, at Point McKenzie or, or somewhere in there, that would then be used to distribute throughout. And again, what's happening is that the power plant now would send it to Palmer, it would send it to hospital, you have alternatives, you can come from Beluga right now to Teelan and so forth. So there are different power sources now that are feeding you, and they're all part of that grid today. Uh, what this does is it ties in the different components of it and makes sure that if one part fails, that it can, can be fed by another direction. So it could be another underwater line at some day. Uh, there could be. I mean, again, but there's, I no, there's no current plans for yeah, what's going to happen. And again, that's can. probably beyond what MEA would do as a, as a utility. Okay. Okay, and it's probably more related to when you start talking about transferring power from Fairbanks to Anchorage, you know, what happens with, with gas, what happens with coal, you know, there's a lot of those factors that people have marshaled. All right, we're going to entertain a couple more, but we're going to cut it off here because we do have other people that need street bread. Is, I can't understand <coughs> that map. Is, does any of this stuff touch any? Any of when you say connect? It connect up the road. Yeah, okay. you want to look at that? Yeah, we can this right, this one over here. We're coming out of this. This location right here is Edmund, okay? Okay. All right, and then if you come down the road to, and that's where the, the, the uh, re equipment rental, AAA okay. rental, so if you come off of Edmund, that, that, that's that long stretch of section line. This is essentially a section line that goes all the way back to the other end. 
And so it would pop out of heaven right there and come down. Okay, so it's not anywhere near here? No, it's not down the big road. Well, these have how come they went and sent this notification that it could be in your backyard to us? How come we're just Well, I'll, I'll take the blame for that because I wrote that and I sent it out because it does affect everybody in the community council area. It is not just whether it's physically on your property or not. Some people it obviously isn't, but it does relate to the reliability of power in here. We're paying $250 million for a new generation plant that's not even in our borough, yeah. but it's MEA's feed. Everybody here has to be able to be conscious of what's going on here to be able to have an impact. You guys have an impact. This is part of it, not as direct as you'd like, but get on the website, get it into an email, get it into printing. If you think your route is challenged with a conflict, make it challenging enough now while route, route selection is going on so the route doesn't get selected. Now we'll take one more, go ahead. Okay, my question, Dan, is aside from the redundancy factor and the possible uh, local distribution through those swamps and stuff that you'll have to come to on part of this, uh, who's the main beneficiary of this line? Is it Wasilla? Well, ultimately, yes. I mean, the, the load, the largest need for the load is in Wasilla. <laughs> <laughs> but, by definition, do you mean within the core area of Wasilla's town site? What we're talking about is, is that we're serving the, the general Wasilla area primarily around the city. Most of that load, and Gary will correct me if I'm wrong, but most of that load would be in Wasilla and commercial. And, and, and really, what's driving a large part of that is the commercial area there. Okay. Because uh, the commercial users that we figured out the other day were probably about eight to nine times more in terms of their usage than the residential user. Okay, so that's part of the drive. You know, that's where your commercial activity occurs as well. Yeah. And remember, as we said here, our residential area is what drives the commercial in Wasilla, because that's where it happens to be. All right. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Beardsley and uh, Mr. Kuhn here for coming. Remember. You can get on the MEA website, you can get on the city's website, and you can have an impact. That's the important thing you guys got to understand, that you guys can have an impact. And you're looking at four alternates. We already know what the engineers have said, that the preferred route is the Parks Highway. This is where we can have an impact, is to show those conflicts now. Get it on for the how the challenge is on a particular section line, if you know it's going to be around your uh, property area. <coughs> Anyway, with that said, I have uh, Mr. Amundsen from DOT hanging around, ah, hidden in the back. He is going to give us a very brief three to five minutes on uh, where the reconstruction of Fairview Loop is right now. Up front. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. We're going to have to invite MEA out more often because you don't normally get to fill the house. Right I don't. Well, uh, I'll apologize in advance. There's a number of you that probably did get a copy of the project fact sheet that I brought along with me. I only brought about 40, and obviously that's not enough for everybody that's in here. We also have a project website. I can sit here and read the website to you, but the simple answer is go to Google. Fairview Loop Project in Google, and it'll be the top one on your list. So Fairview Loop Project on Google, you get the project fact sheets and a whole lot more information that I can give you in three to five minutes here tonight. The short summary is the project as it's currently going forward is being broken up into four pieces. That has to do with the way the funding has been coming in into spits and spurts. And we're trying to take that funding and move as much of it forward as quickly as we can. The first piece that's going to actually be moving forward is the realignment of the signal at Fairview Loop and Connect Goose Bay Road. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I was just wondering if you're going to hire the same engineer she did before. Okay. <laughs> the, last, the, last, the last go around. Contract hasn't been let yet. No, the same guy. I don't know who you're talking about. Well, I'm just wondering because you know the engineers that designed Pinnacle Bay Road and now Fairview Loop and that whole light area. I mean, it's not been like the top quality that I think that we deserve. Thank you for your input. 
All right. With that, I'd like to. Hoping that you weren't going to. The contract's been, nothing's been lent yet. He's just giving you an update on what's happening. First phase. Well, the, the, construction, the, the, the construction contracts have not been lent. The design contracts okay. are, in fact, under contract. Part of the design is being done by RM Consulting. The other half of the design is being done by Edward Gill and Linnell. All right. So I don't believe either ones. of those. I don't believe either of those was, in fact, the design of record for Nick Goose Bay Road. If that's the question. The project itself is currently moving forward with the f first phase. It's actually going to get C construction. Is going to be the realigning of the signal at Fairview Loop and Nick Goose Bay Road. That signal. We expect to be advertising for construction this fall for construction next summer. That's where that's at. That's that the Clap Road. Road. That's, a, that's the Clap Road. That's the Clap Road realignment, and it'll only be dealing with Fairview Loop from top of the world, and then from top of the world back towards Connect Goose Bay Road. It also extends across Connect Goose Bay Road over <coughs> to Clap Road, and where it connects with Donovan. So that's the intersection. It starts. And then it goes down across the rest. Let me go ahead and finish my initial one. I'll be here for questions, though. The second phase that will be moving forward, and we're just getting ready to start buying right away, is the Fairview Loop Road from Hayfield over to Edwin. That portion is designed through what we call 65 70% design. We've been through the plan review. We're currently getting the final right of way mapping done. We expect to start buying the right of way for that portion starting a little bit later this summer so that if you're in that section you're going to see the appraiser showing up at your door sometime in july august september october we've got 100 parcels we're affecting so there aren't that many appraisers in the state it's going to take us a little while but that portion is going to be getting we're going to be buying right away for about two and a half to three years to get all of the right away in effect so standing here today 2013 three years to get the right of way will be going to construction on the Hayfield to Edlund portion in 2016. The section from Edlund to Fireweed, which is basically the frontage road at the Parks Highway, that portion we're currently working on finalizing the design up to that 65-70% phase at this point. We expect to have that design to that level and the initial right of way mapping for that segment ready by August. So if you come to the Matsu Transportation Fair in August, You'll get to see the right-of-way maps, and you'll also get to see the plan at that point. That phase, again, in August is when they're going to start buying the right-of-way. Again, it's that same about three-year cycle to get the right-of-way bought before we go to construction. We can expect that one to be summer of 2017 construction. The final phase will be between Hayfield going north up to top of the world. That one we expect to have the design to the 70% level by December, early, right around Christmas time. We expect to start buying right away for that phase, January, February of next year. So again, three years out from that, that also should be going out for construction in that 2017 time window. And all of the details are on the website beyond that. With that, I'll go ahead and take questions. Yeah, we like to hand up for questions. Yes. You're, you're realigning um, to totally take out from like the Methodist Church to commit and you're going to come on that little gravel road to there, um, No, it, exactly. we're building an all-new alignment that's between the little gravel road and where Fairview Loop is today. Okay. And, and we're and building a new alignment. Clap, so the clap will have the light instead of? Yes. Okay. And the light will be moved. Thank you. Susan? I'm just saying that that's a done deal. There's no discussion. because you're just telling us what you're going to do. We'll be going for construction. We can advertise so this for all. No well, no, we, all, we will always take comments and suggestions. I'm just suggestions, saying, you, your plan is to do that whether we're here or not. We're, the city of Wasilla, for that portion, is buying the right of way as part of their South Mac project. They're already well into the negotiations and are rapidly approaching finalizing the acquisition. He was here three or four years ago. Yeah, but it's been four years of design and money and suggestions. That's why it's moved from Fairview Loop to Clamp Road. Rather than being at macro, we've had the input there. because of public input. Yeah, we've had the better alignment there. Uh, so nice to hand question. over here. Somewhere you know, all somewhere. of that, all of this started with the bike trail, and the priority seems to be a city of Wasilla project <coughs> on KGB. I mean, your phase one has a priority. It's, it's not a question of, of priority. It's a question of when the right of way acquisition 
got started, and in the case of the right-of-way acquisition for the realignment and where we're at, at KGB, that right-of-way acquisition was actually started by the city of Wasilla two and a half years ago. So that's why it's going first, is that they started the right-of-way acquisition for that as part of the South Mac project. We're, we're the beneficiary of them having bought the right of way, and then they're going to turn it over to the state to move forward for the construction. Should be nice to hear MEA say the same thing about you. Mm -hmm. If they have to take the uh, fair view route. Uh, the state and what we can buy right of way for is limited to transportation functions, not utility functions. <laughs> so you're talking about a policy level decision that the nice guys in Juno may yeah, not be. So I am. You talk to your favorite politicians, uh, they can do wonders that I can't. I'm just a project manager. Go ahead. We have some questions here. Yes, sir. The one of us that live east of Madison, um, Helen, where it comes to the Barry Loop, uh, is there any particular thing to do with the uh, burn extension going down to there and the bike that's burning the KGB? Uh, the intersection of Fern and KGB is supposed to be going to construction this summer. Beyond that, I can't tell you anything. It's not my project, but I do know that was scheduled. I believe they advertised it back in the April or February. But they're supposed to be constructing it this summer. Yeah, to make that connection. So it will connect that. Yes, sir. Does the city turn that back over to DOT for that construction? I, I, yeah, not, I, 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 I don't know. Yeah. I don't want to say speak wrong. I, I, I think that uh, the city got the design, the 65%, and turned it over to DOT. Getting the light in, there's still going to be money coming out of RSA to do the connect at Fern and Edlin and make that a T intersection. But then RSA will have a permit once the light's in. That's the whole reason, is DOT wouldn't give the permit because Edlin's a state road to hook to the borough road at Fern and make a T intersection. Over there. How does the state uh, project <laughs> traffic? I uh, you know when they were building KGB out there, it was obsolete when they started the construction process. And so they must have had a traffic count that was five or six years old. There's traffic counts are, that are collected annually. Uh, based on those traffic counts, and a bunch of very clever people with modeling. Let me finish. finish. A bunch of very clever people that have a lot of experience in modeling for growth rates, yeah. working with the borough, working with the city of Wasilla, working with the city of Palmer, and the state. They all look at you know how many acres are over here. It's currently zoned residential one, or it's currently being developed as a subdivision with 500 houses slated to go on it. They look at what they know, and they then try and prognosticate as best they can what else is going to happen out there and they generate models to come up with growth rates for all of the different traffic rates across the Madison borough. Those models are what generate the numbers that we use. Now, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not. I can tell you it's an ongoing process. They continue to define the models. Every two to three years they basically do almost a complete update to reflect, hey, over the last three years we're seeing 20% or in the last three years somebody came and we just got done filing for a two-section subdivision that are going to be half-acre lots and they adjust the numbers. So, or for those of you that are aware of it, Siri's about to drop a cotton sized uh, shopping mall in at the intersection of Trump Road and Palm Wonsola Highway in the next two to three years. Needless to say, that wasn't in the traffic models for Pomerosilla Highway and Trump Road. So guess what? We're going to get to play catch up again. So sometimes, yeah, was Big Bear or the Three Bears uh, grocery store plan? That's the sorts of things that I can tell you our modelers have more gray hair and they don't have any hair because they pulled it out a long time ago because stuff like that that they didn't expect or couldn't plan for blindsides. So they do the best they can, we do the best we can with our modeling. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think you'd be just as good throwing a dart at the dartboard. But it's... We'll take a couple more and we need to get on to a couple of other <coughs> things. Uh, do we have a question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. It seems like DOT's focus is mostly 
um, Settlers Bay, Shore Boy Settlement. I live south of there, and that hill at mile 12 has killed a couple of friends of mine. Is there any plans for widening the road past Settlers Bay? Well, there was supposed to be a gentleman I, here to back him up. Or is any other gentleman here from DOT? Yeah, I'm over here. Where is oh, he? <laughs> This gentleman here is actually on a different project, which is a design of KGB from Wasilla to, well, as you alluded, Settlers Bay and possibly beyond that. Uh, you're, uh, Jerry, Welch. Jerry Welch. I'm a project manager there, for the right. Goose Bay uh, yep. Reconstruction Project. And, and part of the question you're asking is those bigger planning, you know, where, what are the future dreams and wishes of everybody? To be blunt, Jerry and I don't work at that level. They give us a project. They give us, you know, here's the here's the problem specifically. In this case, connect Goose Bay Road from Southern Bay North. What does it need to be built to look like? In my case, Fairview Loop. You know, we've got X amount of dollars to go in and, and you know put some shoulders on the road and get a separated trail. So that next level of what you're talking about is really ultimately worked on and decided by the planners that come from the Madison Borough, your legislative representatives, and the you know the governor and the administration. We've got some planners that work for the DOT. And they all get together on a fairly regular basis on those big picture things. And it's they generate what we call our state transportation improvement plan. And that's where we look about six years out on what projects can and can't be built based on the projected funding. And I'm going to say, the point I was making with all of this is the folks up here and as a community council, there is a mechanism for you all to give your input and suggestions just like you just did for future projects. And that's a key piece and role that you guys have to give feedback through community council, to the borough, through the planners, so that we don't miss something. Just like what you're talking well, with that, I'd like to segue into Jerry and connect Goose Bay. Maybe a quick summary of where you stand on the design out to whatever, and then potentially, as she asked, farther south. Well, I actually came prepared with a slideshow that is kind of informative to the point where everyone in here would be an expert by the end of that. I am willing to wing it. Uh, my project is, uh, first of all, it's a federally funded project, so it's, it's, it's suffering from the federal process. Uh, but the first step of that process is to get uh, or gain environmental clearance. And that's where we are. We're in a preliminary design and environmental clearance stage. Uh, right now, we are trying to identify a preferred alternative to address the incredible growth in traffic that's occurred on KGB Road. Uh, someone asked a very good question about how do we determine the growth. Yeah, or extrapolate. Well, a, a conservative approach, in my estimation, and a lot of people's estimation, is to take the historic growth rate over the past 20 years and project it forward for as long as the project life is. Now, uh, the project I have is not a resurfacing project. It is not an upgrade. It is what's called a reconstruction project. It's a 4R project. It is the biggest type of project we do, and those projects have a 20-year design life. Now, that 20 years is, is, kind of, is added to the, uh, the, to the construction year. The best estimate I can give is construction ending, that is completed in 2019. And I know that sounds a long way off, and it is, but that's typical of a big federally funded project. Uh, right now, we have somewhere in the area of around 20,000 ADT, average daily traffic on, on KGB Road. And using the historic growth rate of about 2.7%, that doubles in 20 years to 40,000. Highways, uh, multi-lane highways, <laughs> accommodate a certain amount of traffic of the type that's on <coughs> KGB Road, much like a pipe or uh, a conductor uh, uh, carries electricity. We need a certain amount of, uh, of, of uh, lanes, a certain amount of pavement to uh, safely transmit traffic from point A to point B. 
KGB road is what we term a principal arterial road. It is not a local road. It is a road uh, that, that our governing uh, guidance, uh, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, also known as AASHTO, recommends that we build this road, this type of road, so that at the end of its design life, it is providing a certain level of service. And level of service for highways and intersections and segments of roadways are measured in delay. 60 seconds of delay and greater at an intersection is not considered good. It took me and my compadres over two hours to get here tonight because we were delayed. But it was, we weren't delayed by the capacity of the Glen Highway, we were delayed by an unfortunate fatality on the, on, on the way to the town. But we were delayed nonetheless. Do you have another route to get here? No. <laughs> 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 we were getting all the way and wouldn't be here at all the time when we thought about taking the submarine. Should have used the bypass. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> should have used Port Authority. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I'm surprised I'm doing as well as I am. I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bear with me because I usually get the point of a bunch of pretty pictures. Uh, you're going to have a lot of questions when I get finished talking. <coughs> my, my, uh, my team and I have come up with uh, what we believe is, is a good alternative to accommodate uh, your commute and your into town and back out to uh, Settlers Bay uh, to, uh, with uh, a, a divided uh, multi-lane highway. Uh, that would consist of four lanes between Settlers Bay and uh, Fairview Loop. And, and, and traffic builds as you get, go towards Hench. You get more cars because you've got more people feeding on it. And, and the, uh, from Fairview Loop down to the, the Farmer Wasilla Highway, you can anticipate a need for six lanes. Three in each direction. <coughs> uh, I have, uh, that, that would provide. Using the 2.7% growth rate, that would provide a level of service C. Uh, levels of service are much like, uh, they're, they're given letter grades, much like uh, our, all our smart children get, uh, get A's, B's, C's, D's, or whatever they did, uh, they get B's and F's. Uh, a level of service C is what we're shooting for. And that, that, is, that is a good, nice flow at 20 years. We don't want to have the road failing at the design by year. Uh, Yes, Are you going to fly on the moose to ground if you have a six-lane highway? I, 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 we have looked at moose crashes. There's, there's not a lot we can do about moose crashes except perhaps light the highway up <coughs> like fireworks. The problem when we start to talk about lighting is uh, we have an awful lot of Several resolutions, and I can, I can list a lot of uh, topics you might want to uh, think about. But moose would be one. Uh, our moose policy does not lead us to believe that we're going to fully illuminate the far side. One thing we do with, with a four arm project. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, that's yours. Uh, I was going to say, just overview of where you are, because we're without the slideshow, and I apologize for not. That, that's fine. If you want to invite us back, we're happy to come. Here's where we are. Uh, I have identified the 55 mile an hour uh, alternative for this for KGB uh, We presented uh, our uh, our findings to uh, the, the Transportation Advisory Board, the borough, the the borough's Planning Commission, and we also uh, to the City Planning Commission. The, the City of Wasilla has objected to our plan, and they initially asked us instead of the divided six lane. They asked us to put in the five-lane section, which is the four <coughs> lanes with the center-left turn. Uh, the, the department does not see that as, as providing the capacity, and it, and it has what I will term a, a deplorable safety profile. There's an awful lot of traffic going at high speeds. Uh, the city retained the services of a consultant from outside uh, who ha has worked with the city. The city has asked us to pause our, our concept development and our environmental document development and, and uh, explore the possibility of putting in a series of roundabouts on KGB. Oh, yeah. 
I think I'd say it wasn't my idea, so there's really no need. I hate to say something, but I really hate to say something. I've been living on this road for a long time, and 55 already is too fast. There are so many subdivisions that have been built off the road. And as you drive along, somebody's trying to, to turn. You have outrigger going this way. You have somebody trying to pass this way. Around let, somebody trying to turn left. Let me talk about speed limits for just a moment. The way they are determined is by the way but people look drive. The subdivisions that have been built out along the roads, they're all along the road. And it happened before the expansion of the road. And I, I've watched this. I've I, seen I, accidents. I've seen so many accidents. I understand. I understand. Let, 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 sir, go ahead and let him get the overview here. Yeah. Cer certainly, uh, <laughs> certainly, uh, speed limits are a concern of the city as well. And, and the reason for the the, the, uh, for the the premise of the roundabout idea to put eight roundabouts uh, on KGB Road, spaced at about half mile spacing at, at intersections, is is with the specific intent of lowering the design speed of the road. <coughs> We, a, a straight road that, that has been used as a 55 mile an hour route that does not have a lot of very sharp curves or steep grades or short, short vertical curves, crests and sides, is, it, it invites a 55 mile an hour drive. 85% of the drivers on, 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 on uh, KGB road are driving about 55 miles an hour and that is how we set the uh, speed limits. The only way to really effectively slow people down is to introduce something that makes them drive more slowly. Yeah, slow and that is where the, 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 the series of roundabouts comes in. Susan, yeah. that's where you get your slower speed. The, I'm sorry. Like the, me, in front. You're the you're the state. The, you the, yeah. 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 The, the state the state has the state has uh, the state has agreed to analyze the idea of this roundabout uh, alternative. Uh, but the state has also asked the city to take on the responsibility and the ownership and maintenance of that road in the event that uh, an approach like that fails and, and is going to require some retrofit, perhaps the removal of one or more of these roundabouts. <laughs> our initial analysis of it does not look promising for it performing very well, but I, I mentioned that our level of service targets for, for this type of facility, the DOT sets at the letter C. Uh, the, the city has asked us to lowest, lower our uh, level of service targets to an E or an F and to lower the speed limit with the expectation that people will find other ways of getting out of here, yeah, like fine yeah. road yeah. or back yeah. road. And we are going to look at that. Now, they, they, they think our 2.7% growth rate is too high. We are awaiting new modeling information, this, uh, the, uh, the, the data that uh, Jim mentioned earlier. So we're, we're taking a patient. Look at this. The city is very serious about opposing this project if we do not develop it to their liking. And that, that's uh, that's where we stand right now. If, if you're federally funded, what in the world does Wasilla have to do with it? Because we are not in Wasilla City. Federal, only funds, federal funds are very sensitive to public input, and that includes what everybody here says. And what, and what everybody in, in every uh, government, that's, that's in, in their community councils, civic groups, churches, individuals, uh, cities, boroughs, counties, those kinds of things. We are very deliberate about taking public input. And when a city makes a serious uh, attempt to uh, inject some kind of an idea, we look at it. And what, what does it take for us as a council to Rex? override that? Uh, I'm sorry. What does it take for us as a council to override the city of Wasilla? It doesn't, I mean, they're, they're not even out here. Let's say they next them and change their name and we'll be <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have an entire plan. Okay, I'll second that one. Uh, how, how, how far out does the city uh, boundaries come? Uh, three and a half miles. They're out to about back up here. They're on this map right here. I have a quick question. Did you study <laughs> it the Six, I'm sorry, the, the amount of cars that have to travel every day, you slow it down already. It's right there. Yeah. Too slow in some places that you can't. I talked about level of service being measured in terms of delay. And if you slow people down, you're delayed. Time is money. Uh, if, if, if Mr. Tilton, are you Mr. Tilton, by the way? It's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, 
uh, if Mr. Tillman invites us back out here, I've got a you know, slideshow that I think everybody here would enjoy that explains some of these relationships between your pocketbook and your time and uh, the safety uh, variables <laughs> with the KGB project. Uh, but uh, it, it comes down to this. Uh, the state sees this as a, uh, as a facility that should transmit traffic at a, at a high, high rate of speed safely. The, the city wants to slow that down uh, in, in such a way that it becomes a commercial corridor and this is what they brought forward for us to, to examine and we are going to give it a, a, a good thorough vet. You're not scared me. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm definitely opposed. It looks like. I want to thank y'all for explaining to you about Settlers Bay because I thought the reason that the road service stopped at Settlers Bay is because Darcy Salmon lives there. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I won't comment on that. Let me say this the family funded project goes from Centaur Road in, 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 in Wasilla out to Vine Road and stops. There's a state-funded project that is that is will be uh, we're RFPing for professional services to design that. Uh, uh, I think the proposals are due May 15th to, to extend from Vine to pa just past Settlers Bay to take into account that that great deal of traffic. Okay. All right. I just put on my business. Okay, my question is: You're the man with the knowledge, and you told us that going down to now. You're going to have the bridge open at the right. What I would like to know is since you have spoken, what do you have proposed for the township of uh, there was another question about what, what about mile 12 and, and those projects. Yes, sir. As a project manager, I get to isolate myself from those things that are not assigned to me. Okay. What I would say about the township of Connick and what I would say about mile 12 and about all of this whole uh, this whole road is a safety corridor to kind of have deplorable crash problems and, and, and safety problems. And, and so I, what I want to I would just uh, invite you to take advantage of the, the STIP process and to to talk to your legislator, to talk to your assemblyman, and talk about nominating a project. I can't go into it any further than that. But we're going to the uh, on the people well, that deal. Uh, Ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Yes, All right, we're going to cut it off. We have several other people. We're going to take two more in the back. You've been very patient, ma'am. Um, well, I don't know if they've ever gotten out during rush hour in the morning. Um, I'm a commuter. I've never been able to really kind of work in Los Angeles. I commute to Anchorage every day. And that place is packed. And um, adding roundabouts and everything else, I just see a huge volume being between 6 in the morning to about 9. It is just packed. Then a and suggestion would be it'd be at the cities planning, because even though you're outside the city limits, you can still have an impact in there. I, Mr. Tanner, you have your hand up there. I'll be real quick. Does the fact that it is a safety corridor along Connect give it any priority in terms of a 2019? Can it be a 2017? <coughs> This project is, is funded the way it is and as early as it is because it is a safety corridor. Yes, that is about okay. Two-thirds of the crashes that occur on the 20 miles of road occur in that six miles, in less than a third. So it's it's a real concern of the department. It's why it, it's why it ranks so high when we uh, when the project is correct. Yes, ma'am. Um, so if we're doing a four lane with a median, what's how how do you make a left? Well, every half, every half mile or so, there's a median break. There's left turn lanes that accommodate a U turn. A right turn followed by a U turn is better than a left turn across five lanes or six lanes or seven lanes of traffic. That's that. that, that there's an inconvenience that you pay for safety. But it's every we, half mile. We every half mile. Oh, All right, we're going to lay in your back. Doesn't have a question. Go ahead. That's the last one here, and we're moving on. Trying to get across the trail. If I'm on, I've already got Well, that's what we were addressed earlier is the stoplight is at Fern, and that will be an interconnector to you know, the I, I understand, but Edna will make a T intersection with Fern, and that will be the light that's already in the design stage. I don't believe there's anything scheduled for lighting at Edlin at all because of the Fern interconnect. How is that going? On? How's it going? To, it's going for construction this year. <laughs> let, let, let me tell you, we don't put signals in when they're not warranted. You know that. 
Everybody wants to say All right, we've got several other people that still haven't, uh, and I know you guys are frustrated. You want to keep going on this, but we can only beat them up so long. No, I don't. You can beat me up as long as you like. Uh, all my contact information is on the project website, and I would encourage you to call me. I would encourage you to uh, use the website to make comments uh, and say whatever you like. If, if you call me, I'll talk to you. I'll answer all your questions. You can email me. Uh, if you email us part of my team, I've got a pretty big team of very smart people uh, working with me on this, and uh, I, I would really like, and, and that, that slideshow that I was going to show you is on the website. What is shows the all website? Website. Sorry. Sorry. What's the website? ConnectGooseBayRoad.com. <laughs> so that, we, uh, you can ask him directly on that. We're going to move into Mr. Rativa. If he's hiding in the back here somewhere. Yeah, back here. No. Yeah, all right. He was number two on the list, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I'm, the, I'm the bearer of good news. I'm not going to uh, put up any traffic lights. I'm not going to put up any roundabouts or, you know, power lines. Um, nothing like that. Uh, about a year ago, the community council contacted me. I'm the executive director of uh, Matsu RCD Resource Conservation Development to help them get funding to put in the by rent and bridge over Fish Creek on the uh, Deer Rod Trail out here in Connecticut. So, uh, with the help of some of our uh, wonderful representatives, prior to uh, uh, Ms. Gaddis. Uh, but she'll be, she'll be instrumental next year, trust me. Um, we were able to get funding in uh, uh, $200,000, and uh, we started working on the bridge. Right now, where we're at is, I contacted all the, the, the players, all the, the federal players that need to be involved, Fishing Game, DNR, all the acronyms, to make sure we're in line, to let them know what we're doing. Um, and I contracted with um, NRCS, National Resource Conservation Services, federal agency, to do the design work of the abutments and all the soil samples and the engineering because they did that for free. So I saved us about $65,000 by having to do it. But of course, working with the federal agency, it it out a little bit, just a little bit. But that actually worked out really good because we just finished last week, we finished all the soil samples. Um, they're down. They're being sent down for uh, uh, analyzation down in Houston. NRCS did that, um, and that was actually really good to delay it because the trail's now broken up and we weren't in the way of any mushrooms or any use of the trail. So it worked out really well. Uh, I'm hoping to derive the initial file this sometime this summer, and we're looking at uh, pre-fat pre bridges to bring them in. Uh, a lot less expensive than stick built up here. In, uh, the great frontier, the last frontier, right? The new frontier. Uh, so we're looking at all different options for the bridge. We're not there yet, but we're looking at different prices. Talk to some contractors, but it looks like the pretty fat may be the, the uh, most cost-effective way to do it. Um, and if all goes well, we'll have the line ready to the bridge in by this winter because it had to be a winter project to go along the trail. And then, in conjunction with that sidebar, we're working on the trail, getting it to. Uh, I've been working with Ray Reddington, worked with DNR, uh, less than shape, we've walked the entire trail from Connect to the home to the, the home site to, to the bridge and beyond. Um, I'm gonna I'm working on a permits for that, I'm working on funding for that. Um, she likes it. We're gonna try and we're gonna try and make it safe and open for the mushrooms in year round use and also accessible to motorized use. So there's, there's a plan in mind for working with DNR. So I'm hoping to open this up for this whole corridor for year-round use, increase the tourism out here, uh, make it safe for the mushrooms, because that's near and dear to my heart, but make it safe for everybody too. Make this a good tool of recreation. So uh, no roundabouts, no lights, no power lights, not, uh, no right away. Yes. Awesome. All right. Vito is here from uh, the Kavada Agency. Maybe I'll work give for you. A, uh, a short update on, and maybe clear up some misconceptions. Yeah, thank you, everybody. I'll be real brief since the uh, hour is growing late. I'm glad I get to talk after the conversation about the committee uh, goose bait congestion because the bridge is going to be a major thing to alleviate that. And I want to say first thanks to Representative Gaddish, who was a good champion for the project down there in Juno and did a lot of work. <laughs> pretty interesting for a lot of down there. If you're also looking at some of the news coverage, some of it reported that we were gone. I mean, some of the newspapers say Kavada is dissolved and we were no longer active. 
that's not the case. Uh, Kabata is still a legal entity that is uh, working for construction on this bridge. We do have, unfortunately, about a year delay because the necessary legislation that we needed didn't pass the entire uh, legislature by the end of this first session. But things that we're working on in the meantime is we're finishing up securing the very few right-of-ways that we need. And I think there's three properties on the uh, anchor side. And the uh, Mass Sioux side is mostly government to government, uh, Mass Sioux Borough, University Land, and, and some others. Um, we uh, continue to get uh, completion of uh, environmental permits and other ones that we need. We just recently uh, satisfied all the requirements of a, uh, it's the uh, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, which means we had to look at every single thing in the project area to make sure there was no uh, artifacts or ancient ruins or anything we're going to disturb has been cataloged. That's a big hurdle that we got past. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of different federal kind of like hoops to jump through as you work on these projects, and we're we're ticking them off uh, quite frequently. Um, you know, there, there was an audit that was released you guys probably read about. Um, while Kabata does strenuously disagree with the uh, conclusions in the audit, what we are doing, because we know that there are concerns from some, maybe in the public and in the legislature, is we're going to update our traffic and residence studies, and we're also commissioning an independent third-party peer review for the work that we've done. Um, I don't have to tell folks who live down in this direction about you know the advantage of having that bridge in and all the good things it's going to do with the benefits for less and especially for folks who commute to Anchor. Um, um, I live in Palmer, so I mean I, that commute gets sometimes gets tricky enough, and I got caught up in that that rollover uh, traffic jam went home today. So the bridge is still we're still moving forward with this project. Um, you know we still have an active procurement going. We got three shortlisted private developers that, were, that are uh, in the department of the state. Uh, so assuming that we get the necessary legislation out of the legislature next session, um, we were we are ready to go to put out an RFP for the proposal from those three shortlisted partners. We could be, we would be in construction as soon as 2015. Um, I don't know if, let's see how, the, the bridge is expected to take about four years to construct and creating about 1,500 jobs per year on that construction. So it's a, it's a good job creator. And then, of course, we expect the economic development and the growth of the southern Mass Sioux, uh, uh, Point McKenzie Connect area, um, to be pretty well uh, in a rapid form after we put the bridge in there. So I know it's late. We've been standing for a long time. So I'll, I'll take questions if you have any. But that's it. The bottom line is the project's still alive, still moving. Kavada's still working on it. And we're still very dedicated, regardless of where Kavada <coughs> is or isn't. We're, the folks who work for the bar are just dedicated to getting this bridge complete and open for traffic. Question here. Question the back there? Okay. What's the projected toll cost that you have on that? Right now we're projecting $5 per trip for passenger vehicles, and it's, it's a little more for commercial vehicles with multiple axles. So if you did a round trip every day, it'd be about $10 projected at the moment. And those tolls, I should say, that the, toll, the tolling price is controlled by the Board of Kabata, and after the 35-year agreement is over, potentially the tolls could go away. But you know, tolling is it's kind of a new concept for a road up here in Alaska. But there's a lot of advantages with it in terms of self-funding this infrastructure, a revenue stream, um, and you know, uh, it's almost like the infrastructure is kind of paying for itself in a way. All right, I just wanted to throw in here. <clears throat> this is a unique financing because the state should just write a check for it, and they're not going to. They, the legislature seems to be slowed up in some instances on understanding the concept that we still should be paying for this road anyway, but we're doing it without federal funding. We're doing it with bonding concept that's popular in America, and we'll have to pay a toll, but at the same time, we're uh, also getting uh, the shorter route for those that are live down this way to go in, and we get the option to get a second route here and not have a two hour delay or whatever. I will throw in one of the things that they were talking about with traffic modeling is what caused part of the challenge right at the end of the legislature. And that traffic modeling, based on what design Knickboos Bay Road, is being revamped as we speak here, as they indicated, with, between the DOT and the, and the Matsu Borough to try to get ahead of the fact that Three Bears comes in, Siri dumps in a shopping mall somewhere, and again, as Jim said, they're having to play catch up on Trunk Road. So these are things that are positive that if you have comments that are, are positive, uh, things you can input 
back again. We're in a digital age on the website. Get a comment in. You actually mentioned too before taking the questions. Uh, Kickarmbridge.com is our website. We do have a Facebook page too. If you guys are Facebookers out here. That's the term. Do, do, a, do a like thing. Do a like. Like, 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 like sure if I'm like some right there. Yeah. All right. Uh, one or two questions. Otherwise, we'll uh, all right. We'll move on because we still have more people. Okay, sir. Mr. Welch would answer my question. Maybe you can. When you when you go towards the neck, and you're going to go. I mean, you're going to go forward five lanes going down, and then the bridge is on the other end. What are your plans when you go? Are you going to make the road four or five lanes going through the village of Gannett? Well, Kabata has a project area that's that's within our, our project boundaries that are legally described. So we go up until about just south of Burma Road there where the T is. Um, we plan on making Port McKenzie Road eventually into a four lane divided to lead into the, uh, the bridge. Anything beyond that is is, is not in Kabata's project area, so it's, it's up to DOT and, and the state and the borough to, to you know, figure out what they can do with the roads. Are they going to do like their end domain to go anywhere they want to move in the community? Well, that's, that's part of the project. It hasn't done yet, and that's where we start. We need to get our input in now, but that's all, these are all intertied projects from Wausau all the way down to the, to the bridge, and they're putting the parts together they have the money to for. You're going to end up with some sections that aren't aren't constructed on the same time frame that others are open. Uh, Tilton, can I piggyback on that really fast? Uh, I just wanted to share with everybody. Tilton sent out 6,400 plus invitations to this meeting, and you know I've never been too concerned with being popular, so I'll just say it this way: we have what we have now, which is a proactive uh, constituency rather than, or excuse me, a reactive rather than a proactive constituency. That's why we have who we have in the White House, but that's also why we have a $250 million plant out in the Kluta where it's not giving us jobs here. So what I would recommend to everybody is that just like you said, get on the website, stay informed, come to the meetings, make sure that you do have a voice in exactly what goes on in your neighborhoods. And then we won't have any more issues that at least you didn't get a say on whether or not it happened the way you wanted it to happen. All right. I've not heard anything like that. In, in, in fact, the way that the, uh, the structure works, the P3 structure, which would take me a long time to explain in full, but the private partner has to keep that bridge open for traffic. If, if, or if they don't, then their, their payment that comes from the state takes, takes a haircut, gets lessened. So that bridge must stay open at all times. Um, we have two engineers on staff, and, and we kind of run through all any issues, but I've never heard of Lincoln's being an issue. I don't know if maybe a tall truck would have problems with that. I'm sure that maybe they just want to go that route if it looks that bad. Because they blow over a bit. On the bus? On the flats. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think it would probably be up to the truck. All right. <laughs> last, last question. We're moving on. Go ahead. Um, is the bridge going to be um, tidal turbine compatible? It will not be. Um, that wasn't in the initial. There's a couple reasons for that. One is that it wasn't in the initial design. It's a, it's a large cost adding. It's not factored in the cost. The other thing is, is we have a um, a letter of we have a, a National Marine Fisheries Service uh, determination of no jeopardy for the beluga whales, which was extremely valuable to get because they're now an endangered species. So the federal government is not putting up any roadblocks for us building that area. And, we think if anything like that was added, the environmental concerns would be, be like, I, I think it would be a setback. It's not at the time. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Mr. Rovito. We're going to move on. There's some local representatives from our government here. Uh, Ms. Gaddis is here. Have a well, I, comments? I, I guess my comment would be um, I just kind of came here to listen, and I definitely heard. Um, I represent the greater Wasilla area, and my district ends pretty much at Clap Road. But that being said, I wanted to, um, and no offense to DOT here, but um, one of the things that as the legislature we looked at and we funded uh, for the city of Wasilla to look at, or if you will, take a second look. I kind of look at it, if we have some really bad disease, Sometimes we'll go to a doctor, we'll get one opinion, and then we'll go to a second doctor to go get a second opinion. 
And that's what, from a legislative standpoint, and I can't speak on behalf of the city, but the legislature, um, again, no offense to the DOT, but um, we're looking at a second opinion. And I think I heard some folks talk about here, gee, I hope we're not going to do it like something else and so on and so forth. And I think because we recognize that this is a very, very important project. And um, I have run campaigns starting at 5 a.m. in the morning at the end of KGB and Parks. Definitely know it's bumper to bumper. So I'm, I'm fully aware that there is so much traffic. Something has to be done. And we have to do it right the first time. So um, I, and I, again, I can't speak for what the city of Wasilla, their plans, but we are taking a second look at it through a second engineer. He happens to be a uh, um, retired DOT per, uh, person from the states. And, and what we really want to do is just kind of take a different look at it to be sure we're doing the right thing the first time. So, you know, I, I, I'm pretty invited, Mr. Tillman, and, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying, and I'm really glad somebody's taking it, because we'll be looking again. Thank you. Do right. we have any other rep I see we have an assembly person here. Mr. Solomon, anything? Oh, that's no. you. That's you, Darcy. <clears throat> I, too, was asked to attend this evening. I'm also a member of the Connect Therapy Community Council. I have an intimate relationship with Connect Road, <clears throat> as many of you may know. And uh, so what happens out there can't happen soon enough. And whatever it may be, I'll be grateful when it is completed for your benefit. Um, as far as the Connect Road Bridge and Toll Authority, I appreciate Mike being here. That's the third leg of a three-legged stool. Uh, our district, in particular District 5, which I represent, is the most, well, let's just say the borough's top three priorities are the rail spur, the port, fishing, because we lost a bunch of fish, and then the Connect Iron Bridge, year after year after year. All down here, all at the end of Connect Road, all the priorities and the capital improvement projects, it was Unfortunately, what happened this year with the legislature and not moving the Fabata issue forward because they're ready to pull the trigger. It's got to be help from the state and hopefully next year the issues that occurred will be resolved. As far as the borough goes uh, and the traffic projections, the mayor has identified two future uh, town sites, one at Fish Creek and one at the other end of uh, Alsop Road, I believe. So those plans in the planning department, they're going forward in relation to the planning out a future town site. That's uh, so 2.7% per year or however, I don't know, but somebody, regardless if that bridge goes or not, the port and the rail are going to be self-sustaining. If we lose that third leg for an indefinite period of time, I only assure you that the port and the rail is under construction right now, the rail spur. Out of Point McKenzie's port, there'll be a ground breaking out there soon, I think June 4th or something like that, when they uh, cut the ribbons to uh, get that moving forward. So, our district in particular is not only in the sites of the borough, but in the sites of the state. And uh, we are the busiest and most uh, potentially productive and economically uh, oriented uh, division of the rest of the borough. And, uh, I've been out here 25 years in Connect Road, not in Sutler's Bay, and uh, it's been quite a ride to watch the 20,000 cars a day mm -hmm. travel because I got hit when there were only 10, and my wife got killed when there were only 5, so 5, 10, 20, and it ain't getting any better. So, you know, you got to let them, yes, we make ourselves heard, we make ourselves known. <clears throat> we've got to let them do because anything's better than what it is. Uh, whether it's four lane or five lane, or if it goes to Vine, or if it goes to something like Bay or Mile 12, you got to start sometime. And the delay is going to come from, uh, well, we'll be sued. We've already been sued on the rail. Won it, got appealed, won it again, got sued again, won it, got appealed, won it again. We'll probably get sued again, but the beauty is the last lawsuit was a request for an injunction, and they didn't get it. So when they didn't get it, we hit the ground running, and we're out there building that rail spur right now. And what that means to the port is uh, $70 million a year coming down there just from Lucibelli. 
That doesn't speak to the limestone or any of the other natural resources coming out of North Star Grove. You know, the gentleman mentioned PowerPoints. If you get an opportunity to see Mark Von Dargan do a PowerPoint on Clint McKenzie's port, I see a lot of PowerPoints. And mostly, people read to me off of the PowerPoint. I was not excited about seeing Mark's until I saw it dynamic, inspiring, actually. And then, tough to get inspired in this day and age. But Clint McKenzie's port is an inspiration. And that rare, and the Clint Bridge is just the uh, Facing on the cake, the third leg of the stool, and the seat is right there at right back. So the, you want to come tomorrow night, we're in a budget right now. There's a public hearing on the budget at the fire station on the Lucille Road. Um, 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Seven or six. Maybe six. It is six, I'm sure. And that's your opportunity to come in and tell the how you want them to spend your money. Uh, you know, the gentleman said to me one day, he said, this body has the habit of not listening to the people that come before him. <coughs> I took issue with that about an hour later. I said, well, you know, I tend to present that. I said, because I listen to every single person that takes the time out of their day to come into this meeting on a Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. I said, but to cut off my nose to spite my face, I got to play. The unfortunate fact of the matter is, I happen to disagree with the great majority of them. Because historically they've got a burn under their side for one specific thing, and six of them show up claiming to be representative of the Nick Fairview community council. When there's only a 17,000, six does not a majority make. So you've got to be really discerning. And I don't, because the people who I know that uh, are not here tonight are home right now watching TV, eating supper, drinking a beer, knowing that I'm in here listening to you people, making sure that we're not swayed by a vocal minority and that we do attempt to do the best. And so tomorrow night is your opportunity. It only comes once a year. We had one in the summer last night. Tomorrow night's the Wasilla one to make it available to all of you. And so if you have issues, it is too late to get anything in the capital improvement projects. But uh, there's a lot of exciting things to do that. SART program, I don't know if you've heard of that, the Sexual Assault Response Team. That's a big deal that's out there. We don't have one. And what that means to you individually is that if we have some form of domestic abuse or sexual abuse that uh, they're double victimized, they have to be loaded up and take the anchorage in a vehicle. And what SART would do is put together an operation right here, but it has to be funded. And the state gave us 125 grand seed money this year, but it costs 200 grand a year. And here's how the budget's going to work. You've got to be aware. If that 200 grand to prosper and benefit the entire borough, and we're tapped right now, that means some other 200,000 is something less important. And I guess that's what the assembly has to review: is animal control or refuse control or this thing or that thing more important than a sexual assault response team? I don't know. Um, my thoughts are that's where we have to start looking because we can't cut the budget. The budget, I think the paper says 418 million or something. That's out of your pocket. That's the only money we're getting. It only comes from the property owners. So, you know, well, we don't want this in our backyard and we come out here for the pristine isolation. Well, we did. And at 20,000 people, that was cool. But at 100,000 people, somebody's got to pay and that requires industry. And then we have the opportunity for industry to be now offensive to the people in the world. Point McKenzie, the port and the rail and the bridge and the prison is there. The prison is 450 jobs, 24 7. Not, fam not the living wages, family wages. And that's what we're lacking out here. If you look at all the economic uh, indicators, the people in this borough live on a, a basic living wage. That's what, unless you're retired, and I see a lot of retirees in here. Um, but the working stuff is working living wage. There ain't family wage jobs out here. That prison is 450 family wage jobs. So with that, uh, that's why the town site's been located out there. And, um, one of my angst is the Point McKenzie Ag Parcels. I think we proved out that that's not the best ag land in the world. But as a real estate Sorry. broker, I see that the commercial and industrial potential are closer to the point, and then the more commercial towards the prison arena, and then as you hit Burma Road, that's where the residential is all going to come into play. So these DOT projects, 
Uh, Big Lake's getting five million bucks. We just gave them five million bucks to upgrade the South Big Lake Road, and there's going to be a trans uh, coming along Big Lake, and all the roads are just uh, in business. You have a sixty million dollar road bond that you passed. I can't tell you where all that work's going, but the borough can. So if you're interested in how it affects you, as the road point there, even if it isn't right next door to you. It's certainly going to affect you. And then you've got your schools. Don't forget your schools. We've got a $200 million bond for Baldwin. We're building a new high school and a new middle school right out here at the, what is it, Alex Drive, the Knickknack Mud Shack Road, where they come together. This isn't a maintenance. This land is bought. And uh, in 2013, we will break ground. And by 2014, those schools will probably be inhabited with our children. Pretty big deal, and we'll buy in the land for future elementary school as well. So, again, road protection, traffic protections, it's an, I'm not envious of their task. That's a, and will they be right? Or only hopes that they're right with their projections and their formulas and their algorithms and whatever they use, but uh, it's not the uh, exact science for sure. So that's more than I intended to say. It's not right, the big deal is the budget. Come in and talk to that again. Where's that at? It's the Lake uh, Lucille Road Fire Station. The public Lucille and Swanson. Yeah. Lucille and Swanson. Thank you, Mr. Senator Salmon. Do we have other representatives of. Ah, I see one from. Uh, Hi, everybody. My name is Kathy Tolton, and I am the finance <coughs> representative of Mark Newman. And he represents this end of the Kinnick area. Um, and we just got back from Juneau uh, doing our work there. His bill is HB 23, which is the Kinnick Arm Bridge bill, um, which Mr. Oviedo updated us on. I want to thank everybody for coming out this evening. I've taken notes on your thoughts and um, the things that you're interested in and let you know that our office is open. We're here for you. I thank the community council for the work that they do, and we need to hear from this area a little bit more. So I just want to put that out there. Um, we're just done. Uh, Thank you to Rep Gaddis for coming and Darcy and just every one of you. Having your input is what we do with our job to get the input into the legislature. So thank you. So we maybe not spend another year waiting around. I would just mention that uh, Representative Newman butts up to Representative Gaddis's district, uh, Clack Road, which means that south of Clamp Road is actually in Newman's district, so don't hesitate to go to the LIO to, uh, uh, you know, get any extra information or to do some input there. Now, I know you all came in here. Anybody that paid their five bucks should have had a red ticket. Now, where's our treasurer with his uh, group? Oh, get him back in here. Is he supposed to have all the dryer? Oh, he's going on there. Oh, I guess he took the... Anyway, we do have a drawing, as it was intimated <laughs> in the letter. Is it too late to hop in for those of us who are late? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was part of the reason. Huh? Oh, okay. I just... I'm glad 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 I'